In the Buddha's analysis of suffering, we suffer because of three kinds of craving. There's craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. In every case, the Buddha says these kinds of craving lead to more becoming. The question is, how do we get around them? How do we get rid of them? Because the path to the end of suffering will require desire as well. We've got the added problem that you would think that craving for non-becoming would help get rid of becoming. But you remember that becoming is basically taking an identity and a world of experience. And the craving for non-becoming thinks in terms of identities and worlds of experience, wanting to destroy them. The trick lies in learning how to express your desire in terms that have nothing to do with identities or worlds of experience. And that's what the teaching on dependent core rising is all about. We look at the raw materials that lead up to becoming and try to get to them before they take on an identity as a world of experience or as an identity of you, who you are. And although the list in Dependent Corizing is long, certain basic principles hold across the board. And the number one principle is just that. You don't ask who is doing the actions in Dependent Corizing, or you don't ask where they're happening. In fact, the process of Dependent Corizing, the different factors in there, are meant to show you how your whole idea of an identity comes about, how your idea of a world comes about. So you want to look at these things simply as events. As the Buddha said, there are events that are happening right here, right now. They condition one another right here, right now. In some cases, the conditioning is immediate. X happens and Y happens immediately. When X stops, Y stops. In other cases, the condition is over time. But the Buddha never talks about how long the time he's talking about. It could be just a couple instances. It could be a couple lifetimes. That's not the issue, because once you start thinking in how long it's going to be, you start thinking in terms of the world. And that's the number one way of making sure you've deal with dependent core rising, you've got to make sure you don't think in terms of worlds, you don't think in terms of identities. Just phenomena happening, conditioning one another, right here, immediately present to your experience. You don't have to think of anything hiding behind the phenomena, because that starts you thinking in terms of identities and worlds all over again. Another important thing to notice about dependent core rising is it starts With ignorance. And ignorance is defined as not seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Because you're basically seeing things in terms of your identity in a world. If you look in terms of Four Noble Truths, there's no mention of identities or worlds at all. Just look at where is the suffering, what's causing it. Is the cessation of this thing possible? Well, you attack the cause, and because the cause is conditioned, it can change, it can cease. And then there's a path that attacks that cause and leads to the cessation. Again, no reference to who you are or how large the time scale is or how big the world is in which this is happening. It could be happening in your mind. It could be happening playing out in the world outside. It's the same principle all over.
As the Buddha said, with all the different factors in Tibetan core rising, you bring this type of analysis to any of the factors prior to clinging. And you can nip the whole process in the bud. Sort of the factors. Half of them are prior to your sensory contact. That's another important thing to notice. Most of the causes for our suffering are things that we bring to our experience. And this is good news. If the suffering were caused by our experiences, the world outside, how could we put it into suffering? How could you change the world enough to make sure you didn't suffer? You look at people who tried to make big changes in the world that way, and they end up doing a lot of damage because they find people getting in their way and just run right over them. It was the Buddha's insight that even though he was born in the noble warrior class, which tended to see problems in that perspective. He said, no, the real problem is inside. He said, the arrow is in the heart. So you have to turn around and pluck the arrow out. What this means is look at the way in which you approach experience, and if you approach it with knowledge, in other words, seeing all the things leading up to sensory contact in terms of the Four Noble Truths, you're not going to have to suffer, because you're not going to be giving rise to the craving that causes more becoming. So what have you got? Starting with ignorance, ignorance, conditions, fabrications. These can be bodily fabrication, the breath, verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself, mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. That's on the immediate level as you're sitting and meditating. But then there's also the bodily, verbal, and mental fabrication that creates karma going on to new births. Same principle, operating in on a larger time scale. But the important thing is you can see the larger factors right here. After all, if you're going to move your body, you have to breathe. If you're going to speak, you have to talk to yourself first. And if you're going to think, you've got to use perceptions and, and feelings. So this illustrates an important principle here. that. The patterns of causality on the large scale are the same as on the small scale, and you can watch them on the small scale right here as you meditate. For instance, while we're focused on the breath right here, we've got all three forms of fabrication. We can choose to approach them with ignorance, or we can choose to approach them with knowledge. With ignorance, we're saying, here I am trying to meditate, and you judge how good a person you are by how well the meditation is going. It all becomes you in the world of experience. But you can also meditate simply looking at these things. Here's the breath. Here are these processes in the mind direct a thought and evaluation. And there are perceptions that hold you with the breath, and there are the feelings that come as you stay with the breath or don't stay with the breath. Feelings of pleasure or feelings of disease. But you can convert them to more feelings of pleasure if you get the right perceptions. So here's an immediate way of dealing with dependent core arising. You don't have to know the whole series. Just focus on what you're doing right now and put your sense of self out of the way. Put your ideas of world, in other words, how you compare with other people, what you're going to do after you leave the meditation. Put all that aside. And then you can look. Is your breath pleasant or unpleasant? If it's unpleasant, what's causing it to be unpleasant? Is there some imbalance in the elements in the body? Or is it an imbalance in activities in the mind? Look at the way you're talking to yourself. Look at the perceptions you're holding in mind. Maybe you should try a different perception. When you're thinking in these immediate terms, 
Yeah, you're bringing knowledge to these processes so that instead of being a cause for suffering, they're actually a path to the cessation of suffering. And then these fabrications in turn will affect your consciousness. Your consciousness will affect name and form. Name and form is basically the five aggregates. And those are right here, too. Simply that fabrication is divided up into a few other categories, attention, intention, contact. You look at how you pay attention to the breath. You can look at your intentions in staying with the breath. You look at how your perceptions and your attention and your intentions all play off one another. And again, as long as you keep you out of the picture and simply look at what's causing what to happen here, and passing judgment, is this good, is this not good? If it's not good, what can be done to change it? That's bringing knowledge to these, pro <coughs> it's bringing knowledge to these processes. These are the things that condition your senses, and then from the senses they condition the contact you have with the world. Now the pattern of the dependent arising goes on from there. From the contact there's feeling, from feeling there's craving, craving there's clinging, from clinging there's becoming. And once you've got becoming, there's birth, aging, illness, death, all the suffering. But notice the really important factors are prior to sensory contact. And where do you deal with those factors? You deal with them as you meditate. This is why when we meditate we're not contemplating big abstract truths, we're simply here to watch the workings of the mind, to see what conditions what, and how those conditions can be moved in a good direction. All the time keeping our sense of us as much in the background as possible, keeping our sense of the world as much in the background as possible. That's when you're turning these factors of dependent arising from conditions for suffering into factors of the path. So you still got desire. It's not like you pretend that you don't want to come to the end of the path. You don't want to put an end to suffering. You don't want to put an end to the different forms of craving. I was listening the other night to somebody saying just that, that the Buddha puts you in a bind. He tells you you suffer because of sensuality, craving for sensuality. But if you crave to have an end of sensuality, it's a craving for non-existence, and that's a form of suffering too. And so the solution they said was just not have any desire at all. Of course, why would you not want to have desire? Because you want to put an end to suffering. But that wasn't the Buddha's approach. He says we suffer because we approach things thinking in terms of becoming our identity in a world of experience. So just change the way you frame your desires. Tell yourself you want to understand the fabrications of the mind, the workings of the mind, and get you and the world out of the picture as much as possible. And that kind of desire gives results. So even though dependent arising is complex, and there's that famous passage where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, it looks complex, but it's really simple. And the Buddha said, no, it really is complex. It's because it's so complex that we get entangled in suffering. But you can take it apart, break it down, so that it becomes a manageable teaching. And the Buddha's primary way of doing this is focusing on the breath, seeing the breath as bodily fabrication, seeing the events in the mind as mental fabrication, engaging in verbal fabrication with as little you in there as possible.
And that can be enough to cause this whole pattern of causes and conditions leading to suffering to begin to unravel. So keep your focus right here. Keep the way you frame the issues right here. And your desire for the end of suffering can become a reality. <laughs>